Welcome back, North Freedom Baptist. It's good to see you once again. Another wonderful Sunday to gather together and worship our Lord and Savior. And just glad to be together with all of you. And uh, it's good to be able to continue to worship together. Amen? Amen. Yeah, let's keep praying about that, though. Things are starting to get a little bit more tense health-wise around Sauk County. So uh, keep praying and keep doing what you can to keep yourself healthy and safe. Um, this morning, as we get together, just a couple of announcements. Uh, there is the food pantry uh, happening again this week. If you'd like to serve there, uh, please let me know and I can get you hooked up. Um, I probably will not be there this week. I'm going to be on vacation this week. So if you don't hear too much from Pastor Andy, that's why, uh, throughout the week, I'm on vacation. But if something does come up, feel free to let me know or talk to Mike or talk to Andy. And uh, they can uh, get you squared away there. Um, there is a business meeting following our service this morning. Uh, it's a real light meeting today, just some reports uh, to go over to look at. We missed our April meeting, so this one's kind of important for us to get uh, taken care of. So if you can stick around for a few minutes after the service today, that would be appreciated. We are going to continue our Confident Faith uh, study tonight. Lindsay should be here this evening, correct? Awesome. So uh, the expert is in, and uh, we'll continue to lead in guidance uh, tonight. So looking forward to that. And ladies, you have a meeting coming up here in just a couple Thursdays. So more information uh, coming up next Sunday as well about that. So I think that's all that we have. There's a couple of birthdays coming up here on the 31st, which is just over a week away. And uh, Lexi's not here today, but she just celebrated her birthday. So, uh, if you see Lexi or email her or something like that, make sure you wish her a happy birthday. All right. Am I forgetting anything? Anything we need to talk about this morning? Well, I'm going to read this morning to open up our, our time of worship together from Psalm 33, verses 5 through 12. I'll have an opening prayer, and then we can begin our time of worship together. From Psalm 33, verse 5. The Lord loves justice, excuse me, the Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of His unfailing love. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. Their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. Let's have a word of prayer this morning. Father, this morning we gather together today on another beautiful Sunday that you have provided for us. It's warm outside, the sun is shining, and we're cool and comfortable inside. We're thankful, Father, that we can be here together to hear from you, to hear from your word, to be reminded once again that we are your children, we have been created by you, that we have been redeemed by you through your Son, Jesus. We have an eternal destiny, an eternal inheritance. We have your Spirit with us. We have your Word that can guide us. Father, we are a blessed people. Father, today we reflect upon the fact that you have made all things by the Word of your power. You are an almighty, magnificent, holy God. You are in charge of all things, and in you we put in place our trust. We pray for your guidance and direction this morning. We pray that you would join us and lead us to draw near to you and to one another. Father, we lift up this morning those who are not with us today. We pray that you would draw near to them and bless them, comfort them. And those who could not be with us on regular Sundays, we pray that you would just help them to know that we love and care for them. And that you are there uh, meeting with them, that through our common faith we are together today. Father, we do want to say thank you for being with Alan Clary this week and thank you for the procedure that he uh, was able to have and the medicine that he was able to get that had just uh, helped his health so much. And we look forward to his soon safe return home uh, early this week. We pray that you would continue to glorify your name and through him and his health. We pray, Father, that you would be with others in our church family who are struggling with health and with Don and his cancer situation, and we just think of others, Father, who have 
had uh, some illnesses over the past couple of months, and we pray that you would bless them and heal them. We pray, Father, that you would continue to provide for our community, provide for our church and the ministries here, help us to be the church that you call us to be, that we would bring you honor and glory. We pray for churches scattered around the world, NAB churches and missions and ministries. We pray that your will would be done. Provide for them, encourage their hearts, strengthen them. And for those who suffer persecution in the name of Christ, we pray that you would bless them, give them strength, give them courage, help them to continue to be bold in their ministry, planting churches and sharing and proclaiming the name of Christ, the salvation of you. We pray, Father, that you would continue to bless and guide and direct us here at North Freedom Baptist, provide for us in our needs. Thank you, Father, for what you've done for us and what we are able to do. We pray that you would just help us to continue to glorify your holy name. We pray that you would guide us now to a time of worship, that our hearts would be Turn towards you to give you honor, glory, and praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. Call up our singers this morning as we prepare for a time of praise and worship for song. If you stand with me, we'll recite together Revelation 4, verse 11. You can see it there on the screen. As we lead into a time of God is our great creator. You are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their need. Let's praise our creator. Anyone able to see the comet go by this week? 
at all. The NeoI is coming, I think it's called. It's supposed to be up in the northwest sky in the late dusk, 10, 11 inch. Uh, it's one of those one in every couple thousand year comets. So if you get a chance to look out there, make sure you do one of, the, one of the other amazing things that God has created. Well, take your Bibles with me if you would please and turn to Luke chapter 6 for our Bible gospel reading this morning. chapter 6, verses 20 through 26 for our reading today. Verse 6, on another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew, I did the wrong verse. I was like, wait a minute, this isn't what I prepared. These are wonderful verses, and it shows the mighty power of Jesus to be able to forgive sins, but that's not verse 20. I got stuck on the 6. All right, yeah, there we go. It's supposed to be the Beatitudes today. Oh, I need a vacation. <laughs> Luke 6, verse 20 through 26. Here we go. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you, Reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their fathers treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you. For that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. Jesus, part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Matthew's and Luke's accounts are slightly different, but uh, possibly because they were, Jesus gave that sermon several times, more than just once. So each one recording a possible different uh, situation in which that sermon was given. But blessed are the poor, blessed are those who hunger for righteousness, blessed are those who weep. way of life for Christ's disciples. The life that Christ has purchased for us through his death upon the cross. He is our Savior. We love him. I love him and love to serve him and care for him and listen to his words and strive to live by them each and every day. Let us sing of our Savior, our Redeemer, one more time this morning. Hymn number 526 and on the screen, All That Thrills My Soul is Jesus. Verses 1, 2, and 4. Thank you.
wonderful hymns that remind us and allow us to express our gratitude and our love and joy for our Savior and our Heavenly Father and what they have done for us in bringing us to eternal life. Thank you for all that they have done. Take your Bibles, please, if you would, and turn to Psalm 115, verse 16. Kind of the main passage for our message this morning. We're going to be bouncing around uh, the Old Testament, a little bit of the New Testament, quite a bit this morning. But a passage to begin our time, and we'll see this in a few minutes as well for our message today. Continuing with gospel-driven living, what does it mean to live as uh, Christ's disciples in this world, especially in this day and age, which there are so many issues coming up, and I think that as we go through these, I'm realizing more and more that these are not new issues, they're just issues that currently are really uh, in the news, they're in people's faces a lot, it's, they're in headlines uh, way too often, and um, we need to have some more biblical godly perspective on these issues. And so, today we're going to tackle caring for creation, environmentalism. What does the Bible have to say about that? Beginning in Psalm 115, verse 16. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth He has given to man. Caring for creation is a command that Christians take seriously. This, amongst other issues that we have talked about and will talk about, is tough. Talking about the environment can lead to some interesting uh, discussions and heated arguments. Anybody ever get into a rather deep debate with somebody about environmentalism, global warming, something to do with creation, the world, how people should treat it, use it, all such things? Sometimes this can be a very sticky situation. Some people, including Christians, don't care much for the environment at all. Some people just use it to make themselves wealthy and don't care what happens, as long as they get their money. Some people just kind of take it for granted. It's there, it's always been there, it always will be there, it doesn't matter what I do or don't do. Some care too much for the environment, which leads to decisions to value animals and land and resources over the lives of some worship nature. In fact, most of the, many of the false religions throughout world history have had something to do with worshiping nature. And others mistreat other people for not caring about the environment as much as they do. And then there's the whole debate about global warming, or global cooling, or something in between. There's always some major catastrophe that's ready to take out the earth if we don't do something about it right now. And it always grabs headlines. It seems to me that it's meant to grab people's attention so that we would focus on the authorities and allow them to do much more than they really need to do. It can be hard sometimes to know what the right thing is to believe and what the right thing is to do. So this morning, knowing that we are ultimately responsible to our Lord, I want to help us glean from the Scriptures a biblically minded point of view of what God expects of His redeemed children regards to the environment, creation. As those who believe in Christ are transformed and enabled to live holy lives, how should we live in relation to this world that God has given us, that He's created? I'm not a scientist and I'm not an environmentalist. I've taken a couple of classes, but that was almost 20 years ago. Um, I don't have a lot of answers to a lot of questions that a lot of people bring up. And I'm not even sure if there's really a global warming crisis or not. But it is rather interesting that every couple of weeks we see somebody who has claimed a global warming crisis come out and say, well, maybe it's not as bad as we thought it was. Just this week I read an article, someone stating that very same thing. Yeah, there's a problem, but you know, it's, we're not going to go away today. The earth isn't going to die today. We must be careful, I think, to base our opinions in the scriptures and let them guide us to explore and enjoy creation without exploiting it in worship. The uh, outline for today really isn't much of an outline, it's, a, it's six statements. In my study preparing for today, I discovered these statements and 
I thought, well, I can't go any better than this guy did with these statements. So I'm just going to borrow Chip Ingram's statements. Anybody ever heard of Chip Ingram? Pastor out of California. I listen to his messages sometimes. Um, and uh, these are just really down to earth, really seem to encapsulate everything that the scriptures say about the environment and what we should do as believers with the environment. So we're going to borrow these and look at some of the scriptures that come off that support these statements here this morning to lead us into a biblically minded point of view. And they kind of build on each other and work with each other. Some of them are kind of obvious that we've talked about in the past. So some of them we're going to just cruise right over rather quickly. And others we're going to focus on just for a few minutes longer. But our first of six this morning. The earth belongs to God. I think that's pretty obvious, right? Especially for those who have grown up in church. I mean, we all know Genesis 1-1, right? Can you quote it? Can you say it? In the beginning, God created Genesis 1, 1. He created it in the beginning, so it must belong to the one who created it, right? God owns the earth. It belongs to him. Other verses that talk about this, Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Humanity and all of the animal kingdom as well. Psalm 89, 11. The, earth, the heavens are yours, and yours also the earth. You founded it in all things. Psalmist proclaiming over and over, and in other areas as well, that this earth creation belongs to God. It's interesting in Exodus, as God is just about to give the Ten Commandments to his children, he says that you are to obey me fully and keep my covenant, because I chose you to be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, he says, you will be for me. So not only is the whole earth his, but all the nations, all the tribes, all the people groups of earth belong to God. Everything and everyone that is created belongs to God. And of course, Genesis 1.31, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. God likes his creation. He liked what he did. He spoke, and he formed humanity with his hands out of the material that he spoke into being. He cares about his creation. It belongs to him. How many of us have things that belong to us that maybe we created? Children? Anybody here good with arts, crafts, woodworking, uh, engineering, build something like that? You know, that's part of what it means to be made in the image of God. We've got this ability to create, to take what God has given us and do something with it. And when we create something, we're like, wow, hey, that's pretty good. I like that. And we value that. It belongs to us because we made it. The earth is valuable. It is precious. It's irreplaceable. Only God can truly replace the earth. And it is sacred. Yes, sacred. God made it, so it's sacred. It has been set apart by God to be this unique place where His creation can honor and glorify Him. We're going to get into that a little bit more. But it was set apart to bring him honor and glory. It's special. And so it should be treated as something that is special and unique. We honor God when we honor God's creation. Secondly, this morning, God appointed humanity with dominion over the earth. We just read from Psalm 115, verse 16. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to Think about that. This planet, he has given it to us. We are at the apex of his creation. Everything was prepared just for us. He's given it to us to live on, to take care of. Genesis 1.28, we read this quite often. But he says, fill the earth. Have families, produce children, spread throughout the whole world, subdue the earth, rule over it and the fish and the sea and the birds and over every living creature. In Genesis 2.15, man is placed in the garden. He says, take care of it, work it. Do something with what I've given you. Subdue and rule. Those are two unique words that have often caused a lot of controversy in churches and in the general world at large. People hear that and they think, well, you just think then that you can just do whatever you want with the world. It doesn't matter. Well, it does. We have been given authority. That's true. We have essentially been given absolute control as far as created beings over the earth. 
Humanity is fully in charge of this world on God's behalf. That was what we were created to do. To do well with it, to cultivate it, to develop it, to grow it, to tame it. Anybody here like working in the garden? I know sometimes it's a chore, yes, but there are times. We do. We enjoy being in creation. Right? Hunters, you like being out there? And just Sometimes it's just nice to sit out there, right? Yeah. Fishermen? Yeah, I know there's a couple of fishermen out here. You enjoy that, being outdoors. Some of us run outdoors and we just see it quickly fly by. But it's something to be enjoyed, to be developed, cultivated, tamed. That also brings along with it a responsibility to care for it the way God would care for it. Ruling and stewardship always go together when it comes to the environment, when it comes to anything. God has given us everything we have to use it in a proper way that will bring Him honor and glory. A way that would help other people to see that He is real and more about who He is. And even though we have fallen as a human race into sin, we're not able to take care of this world as the way that we were intended to, and the world itself is fallen, it is cursed, it is not right, it is not the way it should be, I mean, we can, we're experiencing that right now with this virus that's out there and tornadoes and heat waves and hurricanes and all these other things that we're not really supposed to be. But because creation itself has been distorted because of our sin, there are problems. But yet we are still given command to take care of this world, to rule over it and do it that has never been rescinded. We are the earth's vice regents. It's kind of like a Pharaoh Joseph relationship. Remember the story of Joseph in the Old Testament? He was sold into slavery. Eventually he becomes, you know, the second most important person in all of Egypt. God is like Pharaoh and we are like Pharaoh. Or we are like Joseph, excuse me. God tells us what to do, and we are to do it. And take care of this world in his stead. Leading from that, leading to the third statement this morning, the earth has intrinsic value and reflects the character and beauty of the Creator. Because of who created it, because of who He's given the authority and responsibility of taking care of it, we see that this is a special, special place. It has a unique value. And of course, like all things that are created by someone, they say something about the Creator, the one who Psalm 19, 1 and 2, uh, we looked at this verse last week, uh, last Sunday night, uh, with our Confident Faith study. And the, uh, the uh, speaker there was telling us about the cosmos, the universe, and how the magnificence of the universe points to the designer. Tonight is all about looking at the earth and the little stuff, um, and how that points to a designer as well. But all of it was created, the psalmist says in Psalm 19, to declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. Declare, proclaim, pour forth, reveal. I mean, the earth doesn't sing. The creation doesn't speak like we speak. But just by doing what it was supposed to do, it does speak. It does show what it's supposed to be doing. The creation, a creator is there. And they're unique, they're valuable, they're so precious. We learned so many awesome things last week. It was mind-boggling. We're going to learn more tonight. Creation is just magnificent. It's uniquely valuable. But in Romans 1, 19 and 20, we read that since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have clear, been clearly seen, being understood from what's been made, so that men are without excuse. The creation points to a because of the special revelation we're given in the scriptures, we know that who this creator is in a personal way. All of creation is meant to show us that God is real, that he exists, he's powerful, and he's provided for us. And through his special revelation, it shows us that we can know him and serve him. God intends his creation to announce and communicate who he is and what he is like created the earth with beauty, and our task is to preserve that as much as possible. We are free 
Chip Ingram says, to explore but not exploit, free to enjoy but not worship. Sometimes we can get carried away with stuff. And we can actually become, a, 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 um, we, we can begin to worship the things that we own, the things that we're given. Uh, we can value something so much, it becomes so important to us that it takes the place of God in our lives. We've got to be careful that creation doesn't do that. We're here to enjoy it, to live on it, and to use it wisely for God's glory so that other people will see Him and know Him. Fourthly, this morning, humanity is placed in the middle of the created hierarchy and is uniquely responsible to God above and for created beings and resources below. We looked at this a little bit last week, uh, looking at how God has uniquely created us. In Psalm 8, 5, we read, You made him, talking about God, making humanity a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands, and put everything under his feet. Everything in the world, which we've already talked about. But there's also a sense of care and responsibility. From Proverbs 12:10. A righteous man cares for the needs of his animal. Verse 11, he who works his land will have abundant food. So there is a sense here where God is telling us that, yes, I've given this to you, but how you use it matters. If you want to be fed, if you want to flourish, if you want to be able to grow and prosper, you've got to do something with this world that I've given you. But how you treat this world, its animals, its resources, matters. Created hierarchy, God, angels. Angels have their realm, they have their duties, they have their ministries, they have their responsibilities. They're different from ours. We were created to rule over the earth. And then, of course, creation in its own hierarchy as well. There's a responsibility, a stewardship role up to our Creator to say, God, thank you for what you've given us. This is magnificent, this is awesome. Help me to take all of this, what you've given us, and help us to use it to bring you honor and glory, to make you happy, to honor you and to worship you with it. And at the same time, to say to creation, I'm in charge, I'm responsible, I'm here to help you become, and we don't actually talk to creation, but you get the sense, right? We're here to help creation be all that we can be. And use it to help humanity be all that we can be as well. All living things have value. But not all living things have equal value. Ants are not as important as humans. We step on ants all the time. How many of you guys squished a, a bug this week? Hit a fly? Squashed a spider? We had a bee in the church I had to snag this week. I had to rescue some kids during Five Day Club from a really weird looking black purple hornet type thing. I don't know where that thing came from. But I was more than happy to squish that thing to protect those children and myself. Don't like those things. All living things have value, yes. And we just don't indiscriminately go out killing anything that we see and destroying things for no good reason. We want to protect species and such that are endangered and possibly could go extinct. But if it's between humanity and an animal, the answer, while often difficult, should be we care for humanity. A responsibility downward to treat animals, plants, and the rest of creation with delicate balance of use and preservation and restoration. We've really messed this world up in a lot of different ways, haven't we? I remember reading in school about Lake Erie and how it was like pretty much a dead lake. Nothing was growing in it anymore. But now you can fish there and you can eat the fish out of there because we have done something to help it recover and it's recovered. There's been oil spills up in Alaska and down in the Gulf and in many other areas. And they're tragic, they're awful, and unfortunately animals have died, and the ecosystem has been, you know, out of whack. But with efforts, uh, human efforts, to clean that up, and then God's just amazing this way that he's created creation to be able to adapt and regrow, things have come back to almost normal. There is risks in using the resources. And we have to claim those risks and plan for things to happen and be ready to take care. For to use, not abuse creation to glorify God. For to use, not abuse animals and plants and resources again to glorify God. For our use as well. There have been a lot of 
technologies and science and things that have happened over the past 2,000 years. I think it's amazing that since the church has been created, since Christ was crucified and resurrected and ascended into heaven, just the knowledge that we have been able to gain since then, partly because of the revelation that God's given us, the Holy Spirit, science is a good thing. How we do science, that is good. Observing things, experimenting with things, trying to figure out how things work, why things do things the way that they do, that is good. It's how we interpret it, who's interpreting it. That's where we've got to be very careful. Because two very different people, from two very different perspectives, can look at the same data and come up with two wildly different ideas about what that is saying. Now sometimes creation scientists, sometimes Christians look at data and they try to swing it in a way that favors God, and sometimes they're not always being as honest about that as they should be. And shame on them, and shame on us if we are doing that. But shame on those who are doing it the other way. Well, let's just be honest with what we see and try to work together for the good of all mankind. We're, we need to own our waste. We need to own our ignorance and lack of care and concern for the world that God has entrusted to us. It's okay to recycle. It's okay to reuse. It's good. It's okay to use the things that the world gives us, that God has given us through the resources of this world. Let's be productive with it, but let's do so wisely. Because our children and our grandchildren, and no matter how long the Lord may tarry, their children and grandchildren as well need a place to live. We want to leave a place that is beautiful for them to enjoy as well. Fifthly, this morning, God commands environmental stewardship to protect all the earth for the common good. In the law, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, God gave specific commands to his people Israel. When you come in and attack this country, when you wipe out the inhabitants here as an act of judgment against their sin, and you take over this land that I promised your forefathers to give you, don't just rip up the land for no good reason. Okay? In Leviticus 25, he speaks a lot about that. Well, not just Leviticus 25, but throughout the entire um, Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. But when he tells them about what, how they are to live once they get into the land, in Leviticus 25, he says in verse 2, When you enter the land I'm going to give you, the land itself must observe a Sabbath to the Lord. Isn't that interesting? He instituted the Sabbath day, one day a week, given just for God, but also one year out of seven. The land is to just be land. No use, no harvest. Just let it be. And you know what? Part of the reason why Israel went into judgment and exile was because they neglected the Sabbath year. They rarely celebrated the year of Jubilee, Leviticus 25, 11. The 50th year shall be a Jubilee year for you. Do not sow, do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the untended vines. It's a Jubilee. It's be holy for you. Eat only what is taken directly from the fields. The overabundance that God provided. That's what they were to eat from. It was a way of showing faith that God provides, but also to give the land a break. It can only take so much. As our farmers know, every once in a while, they've got to do something different, put some nutrients back in, plant different crops in order to recycle the soil so that it can produce more and continue to produce more. In the seventh year, the land is to have a, a Sabbath rest. Don't sow your fields or prune your vineyards. Don't reap what grows. The land is to have a year of the land also was not to be sold permanently. Land ownership is critical. It's supposed to be something that happens. It's important for people to be able to own and take care of land. And in the, Israel, in the Jewish system that God instituted through the law, they were, the land was to automatically go back to the original family owners, the tribe. No matter who bought it, when they bought it, in between how many times it was sold, it didn't matter. It was to go back to the original family so that everyone had a place to live place to flourish and produce and provide for themselves. The world is given to us to help us provide for ourselves. God has given us something and he expects us to work, to do something with us so that we can flourish and prosper. God instructed Israel to take care of the land so it would continue to be fruitfully, to fruitfully produce. They were not to exploit it and make it useless for the future. They were not to chop down just any tree to make, you know, siege towers and ramps and all that kind of stuff. Only the ones that would not produce a fruit that could be eaten. Only certain trees were to be used for war, not others. 
there was save the land to make it useless for the future as much as they could. To support their families and their tribes. You know, muzzle an ox, Deuteronomy 25.4 says, while it's treading on the grain, treat your animals with respect. You want them to work for you, but they can only work as long as they're well fed, just like anybody. Take care of them. Animals can be good, useful tools, but they need to be taken care of. Consumption and productivity should be governed by the boundaries of conservation. Leave something for future generations. Finally, for us this morning, Christ's redemptive work includes the earth. Romans 8, 20, 21 and 22. The creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. The children of God, the ones in Romans 8, who are being talked about as having the spirit who belong to God who are trying to live this world, live in this world by God's Spirit, according to His power, in His Word. Creation will be liberated. Once we have our resurrected bodies, once we are able to be who God fully intended us to be, creation itself will be redeemed and rescued and restored. New heavens and the new earth. 2 Peter 3.13 talks about that. Revelation 21.5. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything. A lot of people, a lot of Christians like to take that verse and say, well, I can do whatever I want with the world because Jesus is just going to make another one of you. Well, how about you loan your car to somebody and have them use that attitude about your car? How about your home? You want somebody to just use your home with that attitude? Well, they can build another one. They've got plenty of money. I don't think so. That doesn't honor the Lord. It doesn't honor what He's given us. Take what we've been given. Use it wisely. Yes, God will create a new one, but that's only because we've ruined the first one through sin to begin with at the very beginning and have not been able to take care of it as we should have. Jesus demonstrated his dominion over the earth as the new human, the new man, in which the church would be, in his, be made in his image. We are the body of Christ through his miracles on earth, not necessarily to demonstrate, you know, what it's going to be like for us in the future or anything like that, but just showing he has power over creation. He used it for God's honor and glory. We still await the time of our full restoration, rule under King Jesus, and we will, and when we can, we will abide by God's word and care for creation as instructed. Some of the prophecies about the millennial kingdom about the new heaven and the new earth, talk about an extremely fruitful and productive world. Just think what this world, and I'm talking about the actual material world, could be if there was no sin. What we could do with this world for God's glory and for our benefit if sin hadn't come into the picture. So what do I get from all this for us today? I think that we should explore and enjoy creation while not exploring not exploiting or worshiping. Yes, we can make money off of the resources. That's part of how we make a living in our day. But that doesn't mean that we get to just treat the world as if it's garbage. Go outside. Be active. See the beautiful world God has made for us. Care for it. Enjoy it. Watch those beautiful sunsets and sunrises and the beautiful streams and even the deserts and even the beautiful snow-covered trees. There's beauty everywhere. But use the land and resources wisely. Be careful about materialism. The more we buy, the more we take out of the world. Do we really need what we need? Be careful about the use of non-renewable energy and resources. There are some things that we might run out of. Or just might not be able to get enough of. Just because it's too difficult for our day and age to be able to get to. Utilize safe, renewable resources whenever you wrong with that. Reuse and recycle. Our recycling as a family is actually greater than our garbage. It's weird. I don't know what it is, but it's, we have more plastic and cardboard than we do garbage. Which I guess, but it can be reused. It can be recycled. That, some of that plastic and uh, cardboard and stuff. Some of our clothes are made out of you're wearing stuff that somebody had once used or juice out of or something like that. It's incredible what they can Learn about the products you purchase and 
how they are made, harvested, shipped, produced. A lot of places in the world, slaves are making the things that we buy. Or at least people who are being paid five cents per, per hour or less. It's crazy that some of the greatest corporations in America are selling us products and they're making a lot of money and treating people and resources as if they're just throwaway. It just doesn't matter. Just check it. Let's try and not perpetuate the problem. Money talks. Let's use our money and put it in good places. Let's use our wealth in ways that promote wise use of the environment. Be aware that some do try and use crises for their own advantage. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. We've seen it. We know it. We've experienced it. It happens. And it's hard for us not to fall into that trap as well. Let's be careful. Be aware that the headlines are made to grab your attention, whether they're true or not. They're, ma they're made to get us riled up so that we will make decisions that they want. We see a crazy headline. Stop, think about it, pray about it. Do some research about it before you really act on it. Find out what the truth really is as much as we can, which is understandably understand getting harder. Investigate, learn, pray, and live as God wants. But let us use this beautiful world that God has given us appropriately for God's honor and glory. Father, we thank you this morning for these reminders, these truths about how you want us to take care of this world that you have given us. Help us to, to take up the responsibility that you have given us to rule over this world and to do so wisely. I know I'm preaching to congregation today, Father, that is much, very much aware of many of these things. I pray that you would help us to continue to, to live and to serve and to use this world, Father, in ways that bring you honor and glory. Father, we thank you for our farmers, many of them who teach us and show us how to properly use this world. And uh, I pray that you would continue to give them fruitful uh, harvests, that they would continue to be able to feed our communities and our world. Father, we thank you for those who are able to take the trees and um, other natural resources around us and use them for products that uh, sustain our life and help us to live longer lives and better lives. Father, we pray that you would help us to be wise in how we use these products. Just help us, Father, to make good choices that give you honor and glory. When we discover, Father, that others are uh, using products and using people in a way that is against your word, against the way you have taught us. Help us to be able to make good choices there as well, to call attention to that, to put our money, Father, in various materials, resources that will honor you and help all people to flourish. Father, we thank you for this world that you've given us. We thank you for the beautiful sunsets and sunrises, the starry nights, the comets, the sun and the moon, all the wonderful things that we get to see and experience. So while we know that it is nothing compared to what it could have been, we know that there is something much, just as beautiful, if not more, coming. We pray that as we long for that day, that we would take care of what you've given us now. That it might be, we might leave for our children and grandchildren and further generations a wonderful, beautiful home. They might give you honor and glory and help you as well. We thank you, Father, for your love for us, for your word. It helps us to know you in a much more personal way. We pray these things. Take your hymnals with me this morning. Psalm 50, Psalm, hymn number 59. I sing the mighty power of God. He is a powerful God, amen. Able to heal diseases, create by the word of his mouth. Sustain us through all of life's struggles. Let's sing the mighty power of God today. First verse.
my brothers and sisters, as we're dismissed this morning, may the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us, and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word throughout this week as we seek you and seek to live for you. Take us home now, Father, we pray in your grace and your peace. Guide us through our meeting. We pray in Jesus' name. We're dismissed.